I'd like to apologize to uh, Brother Noah about the first time I came up here. What I do is I, I really get a chance to really, you know, lay it on. So when a debate comes up or something, I always come loaded for bear, always. And I usually wind up getting quails. And when I came up here the first time, I bought all the correspondence of Lee Robertson and John R. Rice and Curtis Hudson and Bob Jones Sr. and Tom Malone with me I had against the King James Bible. I had it on slides and showed it up on a, on a picture on a board, which is a little, little bit rough way to start. And I've got all that stuff now collated in one book called The Christian Liar's Library. <laughs> and uh, I'll have that out here in a couple of weeks. Uh, the last couple of years I've been doing a lot of writing. Last year or so I finished Black is Beautiful, God is Love, uh, The Mythological Septuagint, uh, The Christian Liar's Library, uh, the, the King of the Scholarship Only Controversy, uh, History of Music and Musicians, and four or five others. And I got four more coming up called Why I'm Not a Campbellite, Why I'm Not a Charismatic, Why I'm Not a Calvinist, and Why I'm Not a Catholic. <laughs> I got that coming up. And uh, now you've had enough hide torn off you now. I'm sure if you had two North Carolina preachers here this week, you've had enough hide torn off you to last for a while. <laughs> so I'm going to just give you a little Bible study tonight and go kind of easy on you tonight. And then get the rest up tomorrow. Uh, I've been, uh, as I was here last time, I've been over the, uh, down Mexico, and I'll be heading out to India, Lord willing, uh, along about, uh, oh, about December. I've been preaching in jails, 29 prisons in the last, uh, well, since June, and about eight more coming up next year. And, uh, I'm enjoying myself. I'm at home there. I'm at home. I mean, I, I think like they think. I've got a criminal type of mind, you know. I, I think I think everybody's crooked. And uh, especially the bankers. And I always did like bank robbers. When I was a boy, I liked Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd and Homer Van Meter and uh, Ma Barker and her boys and Lucky Luciano and Vito Genovese and Albert Anastasia and those fellas. I always did like those guys. I always thought banks were crooked. I still do think, I still do think they're crooked. <laughs> uh, and which reminded me of elections coming up, and you'd vote for Tweedledum or Tweedledee, and it won't make much difference. <laughs> there are no Americans running this year. Uh, let me tell you what an American would do. If America was running, he'd say, number one, let's get out of the UN. Amen. That'd be the first thing he'd say. You know, next thing he'd say, he'd say, print four trillion dollars in one thousand dollar bills and get them to the bankers and tell them to get out of the country. Amen. That's right. Print the money. Print them four trillion dollars worth of paper money and pay off the debt. Hey man, put me in. I can get rid of the national debt in 24 hours. Amen. Print the money and give the suckers the money. You said they won't take it. That's what they've been giving you. <laughs> See what I mean, Jelly Man? Uh, it, life is much more simple than you think it is. Uh, Slick Willie got out of a plane coming to Washington the other day, and he had a couple of razorback hogs under his arms. And of course, nobody in Washington ever seen a razorback hog. And they said, "What are those pigs? Where do you get those pigs from?" He said, "Those aren't pigs. Those are razorback hogs." He said, "What'd you what'd you get them for?" And he said, "Well, I got one for Hillary and one for Chelsea." And the guy said, "That's a pretty good swap." <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, lovest thou me, if Simon Peter? Yes, Lord. Okay, feed my sheep. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Going down deep tonight. <clears throat> Hope you don't come up dry. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. Now this is a prayer the Apostle Paul prayed and it never got answered. He prayed for the whole body of Christ to know four things. The height and the length and the breadth and the depth of something. And when he got prayed that thing, uh, all the scholars picked it up and said, well that's the height and the breadth and the length and the depth of the love of Christ. Amen. And of course it's not. <laughs> Look at it carefully. That's the next verse. That ain't the same sentence. Same thing. Look at it. I want you to know what the breadth, the height, the length, and depth is, and to know the love of Christ. It isn't the love of Christ. Now, isn't that strange? 
Now look at that thing. There's some kind of an object there that has four dimensions to it. You want to get in the fourth dimension? I'll take you right there. And it, and it ain't time either. Watch right, that thing, that object right there. It has a breadth, height, and length, and depth to it. It has four measurements. Now you fellows that work with uh, lumber and, and, and timber and things and gas pipes, you know uh, how things go. You want uh, 24 feet of a uh, six inch round. That's three dimensions. It's 24 long, six wide, and six breadth. It's six clear through. I want 3,000 feet of two befores. That's three measurements. Where'd you ever get some with four measurements? Well, there's one structure that has four measurements, and that's a pyramid. And that thing sits there like that, and looking through inside, the other side would look like this. And you look at that pyramid, you know what you have? You got one measurement there, you got two there, you got three there, and then from the apex of the center is four. You got four. So he's praying for all the saints to learn about something that's got four parts to it. Ain't that weird? Turn to Romans chapter 8 and look at the last two verses. Romans chapter 8. Now we're going down tonight, folks. We're going deep. Romans chapter 8, last two verses. That was a verse on your eternal security in Christ. Romans chapter 8, the last two verses. For I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor thing is present, nor thing is come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at that thing there. I am persuaded that neither thing is present, thing come, angels, principalities, powers, height, depth, or any other creature. What's a creature got to do with the height and the depth? What's a creature doing in there? Now you take that pyramid. Is that pyramid? Over there in Egypt, there's a pyramid over there. The Giza Pyramid. And they're planning on having a big reunion there in the year 2000. And Bush and all the Masons and Illuminati are going to go over there and have a big time and crown the, the Pope, the Prince of Peace, and all this gas. And over there is a pyramid sitting on the ground like that. Now it's a strange pyramid. That thing sits down the ground, and one line goes like that, and it goes straight north. The other one goes straight south. This one goes out straight east, that one goes straight out west. Whoever built the thing had a compass. But nobody had compasses back there, 1000 B.C. Compass shows up in Marco Polo, 1200 A.D. from China. They didn't have compasses. Somebody's got a funny, funny idea about direction. Now see the same thing sitting right there? That thing is made out of literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of granite blocks. And there's not a granite quarry within a hundred miles of where that thing is built in any direction. And that thing sits there like that, and the granite's still laid on like that. At one time it had a cap on it. And they said the cap was gold, but somebody yeah, they got rid of it a long time ago. Matter of fact, they said at one time the whole thing was covered with gold, but through the centuries that stuff has all been taken off. Not just right there in the desert stands, and it weighs I don't know how many million uh, tons, up in a million tons, it doesn't sink. <laughs> it's on the sand, but it doesn't go down. In 4,000 years, it hasn't sunk six feet. What do you make of that? Isn't that a strange thing? <clears throat> now, if you went in that pyramid and got inside there, you'd come inside that pyramid and you'd come down a shaft like this. And it goes down like this, and it goes down like this, down like this, and then right below here is a hole, the bottom of this thing. And they haven't got down the bottom of it yet. And a brick line wall going down there like that kind of like a bottomless pit. And when you get in here and stand right here and look right out here, you look at Alpha Draconis. What's Alpha Draconis? It's a North Star. The Dragon Star. Amen. Alpha Draconis. All right, you come down this thing like this. When you get down here a certain way, it goes up like that. And then it goes up over a little hump, a little room right there, a little hump over there, and then there's a room right here. There's a chamber called the Queen's Chamber. Right into the center of that thing. They have an air vent going off here, and an air vent going off here. Then you have a crooked path that goes down like this, and join this thing here. That's all that's in that sucker. Now, whoever built that thing had a weird sense of humor, didn't they? I mean, what's all that doing just to get that in there? And you realize when these things are laid across here, they're laid across here like this, 
So when I laid across here, these places up here like this in the middle of it, that is, they didn't build that thing and then drill them things. When they laid down the blocks, when the blocks finished, it formed those things inside that thing. Not a strange business. Now, your pyramidologists and pyramidologists have gone across there and measured down to here and measured here and measured up here. They've measured in cubits, they've measured in meters, they've measured in inches, they've measured in feet and tried to figure out the second coming of Christ. Most of them say this is the Old Testament. Most of them say that's Calvary. Most of them say that's the church age. Most of them say that's the tribulation. Now, you can't prove all that stuff, but that's what they say. Now, in this chamber right here is a, is a coffin. It's a, it's a casket. And there's nobody in it. It's just an open coffin. Nobody in it. You take the pulley. When the pulley went to Egypt, he went down here, went up here, got in that queen's chamber up there, and he told the people, <coughs> go out and leave me alone for a while. I want to be here alone. They went out and left him for about an hour. And his attache said when he came out, his face was just white as chalk, and he was sweating profusely. Shouldn't sweat. The temperature right there is 70 degrees, summer, winter, spring, and fall. 70 degrees, summer, winter, spring, and fall. Over in Europe, they make little pyramids out of steel and aluminum, and they put razor blades in them. And they keep the razor blade right there where that thing is, and they claim you get 30, 40, 50 shades out of the blade. That is, no, when you fly over that thing, if something goes wrong with your electronic equipment and your airplane. And there's some other things. But anyway, when Napoleon went in there and got up there, he came out there and his out of shape said, what's the matter? Emperor, he said, uh, nothing, nothing. Years later on the island of Elba, where he was dying as an exile, somebody said, uh, Emperor, that day that, uh, that you went into the pyramid, you came out and your face looked like you'd seen a ghost. Did something happen to you while you were in there? And he looked him out of the face for about a minute and said, there's no use to tell you anything about it. You'd never believe me. Isn't that a strange thing? I mean, Napoleon went over there, but he went to that thing. Uh, he uh, came back to France, and he attacked uh, he attacked uh, Russia. And when he attacked Russia, uh, he lost his shirt. And after he lost his shirt, years went by, and one day a guy <coughs> showed up named Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler showed up. Uh, he went to Paris, went to Napoleon's tomb, and Napoleon's tomb has a big chair down there at the bottom with a big N on the back of it. And Napoleon, uh, Hitler stood around a rotunda around there and looked at that thing and looked at it and looked at it. <clears throat> he looked at it almost two hours. And then he attacked Russia. He lost his shirt. Isn't that a strange thing? You know, down there in Pensacola, Florida, where I teach these young men, uh, we got the largest enrollment this year we've ever had. We got 200 of them this year. And when these fellows come in, I show them slides. I show them slides of everything that ever happened on this earth. Every major event. That is, from, you know, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. I show them all, all the battles. Gettysburg, Antietam, you know, Chancellorville, uh, Sh Sharpsburg, uh, Shiloh, Civil War. We show them uh, Shadow Theory, Argonne Forest, uh, Bellow Woods, uh, World War I. We show them the Battle of World War II, El Alamein, Stalingrad, uh, Sicily, Salerno, and all that stuff. And one picture there is a picture of uh, Napoleon standing there looking at you. And one picture is a picture of Hitler. What I do is take a little black magic marker and I put a little mustache on Napoleon and put his hair down and you couldn't tell them apart. They're twins. Isn't that a strange thing? Well, there's that thing that's sitting like that. You go down here, something up here. You know, if a fellow died, you could put him in a coffin in there. And then if something came up out of here, they could get in him and he'd come right back out. <laughs> of course, there's probably nothing to it. Okay, now, take your Bible and turn to First Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 7. First Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 7. One of the main things in the Bible is a rock or a stone. It's all through there. Back in Deuteronomy, the Holy Spirit said about the Jew that his rock was not like his enemy's rock. And he said, of the rock that begat thee, thou art, un thou art unmindful. You're told that Jesus Christ is the rock in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And you're told that uh, Christ is upon this rock. He, of course, he's pointing to himself when he says it. 
That rock is called a rock by Simon Peter in 1 Peter, and it's called a stone in Daniel chapter 2. A stone, a rock. Those are words for Jesus Christ. The stone cut without hands, smote the image, that's Christ. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, make it 2, make it 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 7. The stone which the builders rejected, he's talking about. He's talking about a precious stone, a living stone, a precious cornerstone. And he says, the stone the builders rejected had become the head of the corner. And the head of the corner is a capstone. Now, folks, if you're going to put a cornerstone in this building, you put the cornerstone down and the corner be down there. But this cornerstone is a headstone. It's a capstone. You see the cap? That's that. In the mafia, it's that. In a rifle company, it's that. In a book you read, it's that. Chapters. Chapters. <laughs> In uh, the funny papers, Andy Cap. And otherwise, it's capital. Is that word? Some on the top. All right, he says the, the, the cornerstone is a headstone. It's a capstone. Put on the top of your head, the cap. There's only one structure where a cornerstone could be a capstone. Because a pyramid has five corners. One, two, three, four, five. You see? <laughs> Any other building, a cornerstone is one thing in the ground. When you put up a cornerstone for a building, you dig for the cornerstone, and you put the building, it's on the ground. This capstone is a cornerstone, and this cornerstone is up in the air. And he says the capstone or the cornerstone the builders rejected, the same has become the head, the head, the head of the corner. You see? You say, well, how do all the Greek and Hebrew professors miss that? Well, that's their lifestyle. <laughs> Their lifestyle is pure, unadulterated ignorance. That's how they miss it. I'll take that capstone right there. Christ says two things about that capstone. Turn to Matthew chapter 21, look at verse 44 and 45. Matthew 21, verse 44 and 45. Christ talking to the multitude. He's talking about this fellow has a vineyard. And this fellow has a vineyard and he keeps uh, sending his Man knew it to get the fruit of the vineyard, and they keep killing him and cast him out of the vineyard and this and that. And but he has an only son. He says, I'll send my son and let him look at it. And the son gets there, and they say, this there, let's kill him and cast him out in the middle of the hours. And they cast him out and kill him. And then he says, what will the Lord of the vineyard do when he comes? And he says, uh, he'll, he'll miserably destroy those wicked men and give out their vineyard to others. And then in, where you're reading there in uh, Matthew 21, verse 44 and 45, he says, what is this thing that's written? He says, the, the stone, the bill is rejected, he's talking about. He says, it made the head of the corner, and whoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken. There he goes. But on whomsoever it shall fall, there he is, it'll grind him to powder. Now, do you know what Jesus Christ gave you in that passage? He gave you both advents. You stumble over this one, being disobedient, Peter says, being disobedient. They stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were also appointed. You stumble at that one of the first advent, because that capstone lie on the ground, and the next time that capstone shows up, brother, it's coming down and hitting that image on the bottom of the feet. Christ gave you both advents in one shot. And there's a Greek scholar in the world who can even call your attention to it. He doesn't know what he's doing. They're just stumbling around the dark. You stumble there and get broken. If you hear when he comes the second time, he falls on you, and brother, you is mashed. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 63, their blood shall be upon my garments, and he'll, he'll come down there and stomp down 200 million UN troops and stomp them flat. Whomever it shall fall, it'll grind him to powder. Daniel chapter 2 says when that stone hits the bottom of Nebuchadnezzar's image, he said it flew away like the, like the, uh, like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. It just ground to pieces and poof, blew the stuff off. Now you set capstone, that's Jesus Christ. 
God had the Jews sitting there and he made the building. He got the building up to about here. And he says in Isaiah chapter 40, Repent, the time's at hand. Your, your warfare is accomplished. I pardon your iniquity. Here comes the Messiah. Up comes John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's forgiven you. You believe it? Yeah, get out and get baptized. Get baptized for the remission of sins. For the remission of sins never means in order to get your sins forgiven. Never. Never. God had been forgiven sins for 4,000 years before Christ said, this is my blood shed for the remission of sins. And when John the Baptist shows up, he said, you're forgiven. Read it, Isaiah 40, verse 1 to 6. It's there. It's there. Some of you folks look at me like a tree full of owls tonight. What have you, what have you been reading? <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? Bible, Isaiah chapter 40. The third verse, the voice of one that comes in the, crying in the wilderness is John. Right after it was forgiven. Not to get them forgiven. <laughs> All right. Up comes John. Repent the kingdom of heaven's hand. Here it comes. The Messiah is coming. Up shows the Messiah. What is he? He's a capstone. The Lord said, I've got it all ready now. Now I'm going to pull on the capstone. In come the capstone and the Pharisees and the scribes and Sadducees say, we don't want that. Throw it out. And they threw it out. That's the picture of killing the son that comes to get the vineyard. They don't want it. So it isn't there. Reach in your pocket or your billfold get me out a dollar bill. You got a dollar bill on you tonight? Reach in your pocket and pull out and look at it. Think I'm just pulling your leg? Look at the pyramid on the left side. The capstone isn't on it. The capstone's missing. That King James Bible tells them what time to get up and what time to go to bed. You see that eye on that capstone? You ever read about those Stones there in Zechariah and the eye of the Lord running to and fro the earth engraving on that stone. There's more there than just Illuminati. There's more there. There's an imitation Christ there. But there's a capstone and that capstone is missing. And that capstone is Jesus Christ. In this age, when a man rejects Jesus Christ, he stumbles over him and he's busted. And if you're here and you don't get saved and the Lord comes back, He's going to land on top of you and mash you flat. Isaiah 63. All right, go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And get Genesis chapter 1. And then Genesis chapter 1, start there where he says, uh, the Lord made that universe and he made a firmament. And he made a firmament and poured water above the firmament and water below the firmament. And the firmament was the middle with the water on the top and the water on the bottom. And then he called the firmament of heaven. And then he says in Genesis chapter 1, he put the greater light there and the lesser light to rule the, the night and the greater light to rule the day. He made the stars also. And what did he do? He put them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. So here's your solar system and your galaxies and star clusters and things down in here. And there's water upstairs and there's water downstairs. So you're under the water. You know why you should be a Baptist? <laughs> because you're already immersed. You said, I don't believe that. Then why do you pick four fishermen? Amen. Folks have a time of it, don't they? And the Lord comes down here and he says, I want some preachers. What do you want? Peter, James, John, Andrew. Why? Fishermen. Now you folks up here, do you, do you, do you do any ice fishing up here? You cut a hole in the top. The face of the deep is frozen. And then put down the cord. And then pull up the fish. Amen. On the face of the deep is frozen. That means we get to play hockey up there. Brother Chidi. <laughs> <laughs> now see that thing right there? You're under the water. You're already immersed. You might as well get immersed. How do you explain Christ is suddenly showing up and here's this guy baptizing people just out of nowhere? Well, that's easy. The Lord's about to come down. And he's going to come underwater when he comes. Now, if you went out to Groom Lake Area 51 in Roswell, New Mexico, and got in the ground with the CIA and the rest of the licensed mafia, you'd find a, a number of uh, live aliens. You don't have to put an autopsy on them. That's soul stuff, that autopsy. That's, that's silly, man. That's 45 years out of date. 
Uh, they've got the charts on there, how they digest food, how they reproduce, and everything else. Six different kinds. Um, you can't get it from NBC, CBS, and ABC fools. They're that conspiracy of science. They won't tell you nothing. I think if you don't believe in UFOs, you're mentally sick. They'll lock you up. I've got stuff from, uh, from electrical engineers who've been inside them and described the whole thing to you and how it operates. And they have different kind of aliens. You have greys. That's the one you see the picture of the most. And reptilians. And Syrians. And well, about eight or nine other kinds. But they have a funny kind of a badge on. The badge looks like this. <laughs> it's a strange badge. They wear. But that ain't the strangest thing about it. The strangest thing about it is there's a big cobra. Right in the middle of it. Like of that. So or any other creature. Romans chapter 8, last two verses. Now, people, how many have a King James Bible on you tonight? Hold it up. Hold it up. That's the best thing you've had your hands on all day long. Now, is that book that you got in your hand? That book is always so far ahead of the international community and the UN and FEMA, FEMA, and the IRS and the HRS and the hell evil workers and all that stuff and the NACP and the ACLU. That thing is always so far ahead of the National Education Association, Cape Canaveral, Houston Space Center. They don't know where they're at. And if you got your King James Bible, you got the wildest piece of literature you ever picked up in your life. Of course, talk about let's get back to the Bible, get back to the Bible. You can't get back to the Bible. You've got to run to catch up with it, man. You can't get back to it. You can't get back to it. Nonsense. Now, see a thing right there? If that's true, uh, then there must be something out here somewhere. Shay with seven heads. Revelation chapter 12. A great red dragon. North. Alpha Draconis. You see? As in Ezekiel, a fellow lifted his eyes and saw this image of jealousy at the north entrance to the gate. The north entrance. You see that? Now you take that thing right there. Old Chris Columbus once day sailed the ocean blue. And when he sailed the ocean blue, they said, Chris, you better watch your step. Because when you get to the end there where the water stops, you know what's going to happen? He said, no, what's going to happen? They said, well, right at the end of that place up there where you're going to stop, there's going to be a drop-off. And when you get that drop-off right there, you know what's waiting to swallow you up? Just the other side of that drop-off? He said, what's that? I said, well, Chris, there's a great red dragon. There's a great red, big red dragon waiting out there just off the end of that water. And when you sail along here and you're Nina and Peter and Santa Maria and go off the end of that thing, that dragon will get you. Because in the water. And Columbus sailed right over to the Bermuda Triangle. And Gutierrez, his ship's pilot, has the notation in the diary when they saw the lights. <laughs> and then he comes back and says, there ain't no dragon out there, all is well, there is no hell. <laughs> and he comes back and they say, well, good, I was wondering about that Bible, talking about that big red dragon out in that water. Chris had the wrong water. The water's there. You say, I know it's there. Because if you go up there, you have to be an astro, a star, not do you know what naught is? Yeah, amen. Why well, it's nautical. Yeah. You know that? It's seafaring, it's ocean. So when you go up there, you have to go up in a rocket ship. And uh, he goes up there through the airwaves. <coughs> now, ain't that something? Now, folks, I told you it's going to get rough tonight. I'll, I'll have some honey and milk for you tomorrow night, but. Tonight it's barbecue pork. <laughs> uh, water up here, water down here, something up there. This direction is north. There. Turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Get Isaiah chapter 14 in one hand, get Psalm, get Psalm uh, 48 in the other. Isaiah chapter 14 and Psalm 48. All right, Psalm 48, verse 2. Beautiful for situation is Mount Zion, the city of the great king, located on the sides of the what? North. Sides. Plural. One, two, 
three, four sides of the north. Could that be Palestine? No way in the world. Look at Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 13. Now read it. Read it. Amen. Open your Bible. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a college education. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a seminary education. Talk about Ruckman, Ruckmanites, Ruckmanite, Ruckmanite. Now shut your mouth, stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, they talk about Ruckman because they can't handle that book. Amen. Every time. You know that book, one of these wiseacres? Oh, you're a Ruckmanite. What's the matter, Sonny? Can't you handle the page? It's sister great English. Got a little problem there, do you? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. The devil said in his heart, I will ascend. I'll put my throne above the stars of God. I'll ascend the congregation, so forth and so on, on the sides of the north. I'll put my throne above the stars. It's up here. The throne's up there. The devil said, I'm going up. Lord said, you're going down. Turn to Psalm uh, 75. In Psalm 75, look at verse 6 and 7. I'll show you one of the most remarkable things you've ever seen in your life. Psalm 75. Verse 6 and 7. Now, did you notice I haven't pulled the Greek or the Hebrew on you yet? You notice I haven't done that? You know I haven't done that? That's the way to ignorance. <laughs> Did you know the key to the understanding of the Bible is not a knowledge of the original languages? You know what the key to the understanding of the Bible is? It's a humble heart and a believing mind. And without that, you're not going anywhere. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. For promoteth, promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But what? But what? God. Somebody left out a direction there, didn't they? What's he doing? Change the four directions? South, east, west, and God? Isn't that a strange thing? Isn't that a wild book? And why that put there? Because everybody in Detroit knows right how to get to New Jerusalem. They've got a road map. You say, what is it? It's a compass. <laughs> Come to the dime store and buy your dime store compass. Press the button. Zoop, New Jerusalem. Points right at it. It's north. Amen. It's north. At that time, instead of putting it north, he put in God. Now, I hate to concede that to you Yankees. <laughs> 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 but there isn't any way that anybody south of anybody could win. Right. Right. Egypt was whipped by Babylon. They're north of Egypt. Babylon was whipped by Assyria. They're north of, uh, of Babylon. Assyria was whipped by Alexander the Great. They're north. He's north of Assyria. Alexander was whipped by Rome, and that's north of Greece. Rome was whipped by the Vandals and the Goths and the Huns and Visigoths. They're north of Rome. The Goths and Huns and Vandals, the Krauts, the Germans were whipped by Russia and England. That's north of Germany. You know who's north of Russia? The Lord. It's always been that way. What you can't understand in a college or a seminary Go down to the dime store and get your dime store Bible and read it. Yep. And the thing is that that can't give you more in one day than a college education gave you in 35 years. I don't know what I'm talking about. All right, you take that thing right there. Is that thing right there? You know how much that explains? That explains so much you just wouldn't even believe it. Is that thing right there? Here comes Jesus Christ down to die for your sins. Dies on the cross. He's in Gethsemane. And the blood comes out like great sweat drops. And it goes like that. You say, why? Didn't you know? It's God's blood. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. R.B. Theme and MacArthur say it was just like the blood of any man. It was. Acts chapter 20 verse 28. Feed the flock of God which is among you. You know, because you purchased with his own blood. Acts chapter 20. What kind of life was in Christ? Brethren, wasn't it eternal life? Is the life of the flesh in the blood? What kind of life was in Christ? Eternal life? It's eternal blood. How about that? All the scholars say, well, he 
sacrificed and went up and presented his blood before the altar, you couldn't possibly, he didn't have a drop in him when he came up from the dead. Not a drop. So I went out on the cross. John said he saw the blood and water come out. He come up from the dead. He says, a spirit hath not flesh and bones. There's no blood there. Gone. It's like this. Well, if it's like that, you know what this is here? Why, it's a red sea as I live and breathe. And I don't mean the sea of reeds. <laughs> it's a red sea. And if that thing opened, you go right up through it. Exodus. What's Egypt type of, folks? You got that? No problem. Just believe what you read. <laughs> and then Pharaoh try to get in after you. And it slams shut and down he goes. How'd you like to be on the end of the column at the rapture and see that thing coming after you? You want a thrill? Wouldn't that be a thrill? <laughs> Suppose you're the last one to tail on the column. The Lord calls you out. Out you go and look behind you. Here come this cotton picking thing, 3,000 miles long and 200 miles wide, breathing fire. You want a thrill? I'll give you a thrill. <laughs> I see that thing right there. What is that? Mountain climbers? Mount Zion? Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. What he said, beautiful for situation is Mount Zion, the city of the great king, located in the side of the north. He wasn't talking about anything on the ground at all. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Hebrews 12, 22. You have come to Mount Zion and the heavenly Jerusalem. You see that thing? Read that thing. Hebrews 12, 22. The congregation, the church of the firstborn. See that thing? There are two of them. There's one down here. There's one up there. Mount Zion's up here. The city of the great king. It's up there. That's why folks like to climb mountains. That's a picture of getting to heaven by your own works. That's why mountains make you restless. They call you. Do you know that mountains call you and water soothes you and make... There's a strange thing about, about how God set this thing. Have you ever think about this? That water is moving all the time. Now I was raised on the coast. Of course, I was raised in Kansas, but every summer we drove from Topeka, Kansas to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, and I was on the beach from June to September every year till I was 18 years old. Bare feet, three months a year. My feet are about, about a nine triple E. <laughs> Just look like a duck's feet from no clothes, no shoes on. Uh, I was raised out there in the Atlantic Ocean, and I've been by, by the Gulf of Mexico now for 50 years. And there's something about water; it's always moving. It's never the same. It's not even the same color. The way you can always tell an amateur painter when he begins to paint is he always paints water blue. But you notice how much white I've got in that water up there? If that thing was solid blue, it wouldn't look real. Water is very rarely ever solid blue. If you want to take a picture of a stream going through a forest in the winter up here, you know what color the water would be? It wouldn't be blue. If you want to paint a picture out here in the backwoods, you guys hunt deer, hunt rabbits, and there's a creek going down through the snow, you know what color you paint that water? You paint it black. How many of you knew that? Let me see your hands. Uh-huh. The average painter will paint it blue every time. It isn't blue. Water is colorless, odorless, tasteless. If it's colorless, it ain't blue. In the sunset, it's red-brown, or orange-brown, or purple. I've seen it every color of the rainbow, depending upon what it reflected upon. It's always moving. Waves 5 knots, 10 knots, wind 15 knots, 20 knots, uh, hurricanes, typhoons, northeasters. When I was a boy, I was raised on the Atlantic uh, seaboard up there in, uh, in Roboth Beach, Delaware, New Jersey in the summertime. I was a beach boy when I was uh, just a young boy coming up. Then I uh, helped uh, uh, handle beach umbrellas at a bar. And then I was a bar checker at a nightclub up there. And then I was a lifeguard for a couple of years in the beach up there at Rehoboth. And uh, when I was a young man, oh, around, say, you know, 15 or 16, I used to go out in the northeasters that hit the coast there along about this time of year earlier. But it hit about September. And I used to go out there and try to fight my way out through the waves. And I would just get so mad, I'd get so frustrated, I'd just be crying and cursing. <laughs> you couldn't get through. I never did get through. 
Sometimes I waste an hour out there just trying to get through and come back with my mouth, my mouth full of sand every time. Well, your lifeguard, you have what they call a paddleboard. And you take this paddleboard and you, when the first bunch of waves come in, you throw it over the wave and then dive, dive under the wave and then come up to the side and get it. And if you have two rows away, then you pitch it over the second one, go and come and get it. And then you go out and get whoever you're trying to rescue out there. But when the northeasters had come in and the, and the swimming season would close down, I'd be at that beach 15 or 16 years old trying to take on them waves. Some of 15 feet high, 15 feet high, 10 feet high. And I'd get through the first row of breakers and the next row of breakers would get me. And I'd get through the second row of breakers and the third row would get me. And sometimes I got out there almost 100 yards. But sooner or later, boy, end over end, I'd come in on that beach just rolling hand over fist, head over heels, mouth full of sand, you know. I looked at it as a challenge. <laughs> Now, it's not war, it's always moving, it's always shifting. But you know what it does? It makes you, it puts you at rest. If you want to really go to sleep, go down a nice white beach on a warm day with a wind about five knots and spread your blanket down there near the, 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 the surf where it's just coming in. And in five minutes, man, you'll be sound asleep, and you get up three hours later, and you'll be baked like a roast weenie. <laughs> <laughs> you get out there in a boat about five knots on a smooth day on the lake or the, or the ocean, that thing goes, choo, 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 choo. you lie down, buddy, you're gone. It makes you sleepy, although it's always moving. It's death. That's a picture of death. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. On Jordan's stormy banks I sand. We shall sing in that beautiful shore. Echo back the ocean wave. See that stuff? May there be no weeping when I cross the bar. Your hymn book's filled with it. Your hymn book, it's a picture of death. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. I go to wake him from the sleep. Now you take those mountains, they're different. You know what mountains do? They make you restless. Did you ever mess around the Appalachians or uh, oh, Rocky Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, Sierra Madre. I'm in all those places up in the hills, marvelous mountains in the Philippines, um, um, Fujiyama and Tokyo, all that kind of stuff. A range of mountains does this to you. It says, come here, come here, come here, come here. And that range sits over there every morning. It's just the same. It never changes. And a rock and it changes. It's stationary, but it makes you restless. When you get to one mountain range and see the next one, you know what it does? It says, how many know what I'm talking about? Let me see your hands. Well, if I've got a few people listening tonight, I don't know what I'm talking about. The Germans say, Die Bergen rufen mir. The mountains are calling me. Why do they call you? You're called to go here. That's why. And you've got to go through death to get there. You see that thing? All right, so now Christ comes down and dies, and the cross goes back up there. I read my Bible this. I read my Bible that uh, he is the head of the church and the savior of the body. And I read God set him far above all principalities and powers, not only in this world, but the world to come. So my head's up there. The body must come down through here. Amen. I'm in it. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Right. We are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He that joined the Lord is one spirit. Part, part, there's an eye, there's a foot, there's part of the ear. First Corinthians chapter 12, right? That you're down here inside this thing. You're in the bloodstream. The Lord looks down at you and he sees you sinless. You say, why? You're covered with the blood. Unsaved people look like white corpuscles in that stream. They're not covered. All right, the head's up there. Did you ever hear of a man drowning when his head was above water? <laughs> I'm down here in this universe and my head is up there. I can't drown. I'm safe. I'm safe. My head's upstairs. Neither height, nor depth, nor length, nor bread, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Right there in the King James 1611 English, and there's a Greek professor in the world that ever picked that thing up. And I won't be. You say, why? Because they're stupid. 
the studies make them stupid. That's the problem. <laughs> you know, I preached every year at Carl Lackey's. I just got back there last week. Uh, Brother Tucker is passing that church now. Brother Lackey has been dead a few years. But I've been preaching every year for something like about, oh, 17 or 18 years. And when I used to go there, when Lackey was there, every year he'd send out a, a notice to all the, the uh, big shots around Pillsbury and Piedmont and Bob Jones, Tennessee Temple. He'd say, we'll pay any man that's uh, fair to come here. We'll pay his way here and give him free room and board while he's here and give him an offering and put him up overnight or over the week if he'll come here and debate the King James Bible with Brother Ruckman. In 17 years, they never showed up. Not a one of them. I've been in the Chicago area. Chicago University right there. Bunch of theologians. Where were you when Ruckman came into town? Busy? I've been in the Dallas Fort Worth area at least 45 times. Dallas Seminary over here, Fort Worth Seminary over here. Question and answer was in the morning, 10 o'clock. Five miles from the guy's dormitory. How come he didn't show up? Get nervous in the service? <laughs> you know, years ago we sent Truman Dollar a letter. And uh, he had, he just accused me of doing more harm to the body of Christ than any fundamentalist in this, this uh, generation. And so our board of trustees sent him a letter. We sent him a letter, the trustees did, and said we'd like to have you come here to the Bible Baptist Church, and Brother Ruckman will give you 15 minutes or 55 minutes from the pulpit Sunday morning to prove why Ruckman is doing more uh, harm to the cause of Christ than any man in America. And they said, we'll pay your way here and back, put you up in Holiday Inn, and nobody interrupt you for 50 minutes if you'll come and tell us why. Registered letter. He got it. You think he came? He didn't come. You say what? <laughs> so there's, oh no, no, no. He just didn't want to waste. Don't give me that stuff, okay? Don't give me that stuff. I mean, I go to Baptist fundamentalism with Jerry Fowell and walk down the road there and all of a sudden a hand comes around behind me before I can see who it is. And glad to have you here, Pete. It's Truman Dollar. And I pull back my hand and I wipe it off and go to the bathroom and wash it <laughs> about 50 minutes later. I mean, do you think, do you think if I thought you were doing more harm to the cause of Christ than any man in America, I'd say glad, glad to have you here and give you my hand, but I wouldn't give you the time of day. I don't know how those folks look at themselves in a mirror when they get up in the morning. How do you do it? You're doing more uh, call, more harm to cause Christ than in America. Glad to have you here, Pete. <laughs> what a what a jerk. <laughs> well, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't uh, defile the memory of the dead. He committed suicide here a couple of months back, which uh, which is no great thing to me. I wish he hadn't. I remember it here in Detroit. He got in trouble over here in Detroit with some telephone call or something and the and the Detroit Free Press phoned me up while I was preaching for Brother uh, Bartlett. And the Detroit Free Press phoned up and said, uh, 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 did you know about this, about the pastor of the Detroit Baptist Temple? I said, uh, oh, yeah. They said, what do you think of it? I said, uh, no comment. They said, well, weren't you, had, you and him having some trouble? I said, that's none of your business. Amen. They said, well, aren't you glad this happened to him? I said, no, I'm not glad it happened to him. I'm glad it happened to anybody. Amen. When, a, when, a, when a Christian preacher gets in bad trouble, it might be some big thing to you, you little backslidden shrimp, trying to justify your sins. It might you make you feel good because you know, now you got an alibi, you know. To, you know, it don't make me feel good. I wish you never even got caught. That's how I am about those things. Some folks, when you find when you find somebody you know growing the thing like that, it's always some way that God is musing in there that they're jealous and hate their guts. That's the problem. I don't fool them things. Paper phoned me up, the newspaper phoned me up down there in Pensacola every year. Who are these boys preaching out in the street? No comment. Aren't they from your school? No comment. Well, this part of your training for these preachers? No comment. Well, well, uh, uh, Dr. Ruckman, you're, you're not very talkative, are you? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't trust the newspapers. Amen. Any of them. Cook with a dog hind leg. All right, we're talking about these things here and talking about these fellas not showing up, these places where they ought to show up, and they're not going to show up. Uh, I'll tell you, you do. If any of you got any pull with Malone College, Tom Malone over here, or you got any pull with Bob Jones, uh, you see if you can get me in and see if I'll come. Okay? 
I mean, I told Curtis, I get, gave, we gave Curtis Hudson, he's dead too. <laughs> we gave Curtis Hudson a registered letter. We'd like to have you come by and talk to our boys about, you say you don't believe in the spiritual circumcision and Ruckman's ramblings. Come by here and we'll give you 50 minutes in the pulpit of Sunday morning to talk. He never showed up either. What you try me for size? See if I'll go. Get me a Tennessee Templar Bob Jones for an hour. See if I'll go. I'll come alone and pay my own expenses, okay? <laughs> Guy one time said recently, oh, it must have been about five or six years ago, he, he was talking about Bob Jones Jr. And he said, why don't you just have put an end to this Ruckman thing? And said, just have him in, have him debate your whole faculty. He said, bring Ruckman in and, and put six guys on, but I'm going to take him on at one time. And shut his mouth once and for all. And Bob Jones Jr. said, oh, we couldn't do that. And the, well, I said, why not? He said, oh, Ruckman's too smart. He's too smart. <laughs> what a confession. <laughs> what a confession, man. <laughs> Listen, bud, if I thought you knew more about that word of God than I did, and I had a chance to learn it from you, you'd be in, boy, and I'd be listening and taking notes. The very idea, he's too smart. <laughs> why, you junkie. If, a, if you know somebody knows more about the book than you do, why wouldn't you be interested in learning it if you had a, a straight bone in your body? Amen, 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 amen. All that stuff. How many of you folks have been called Ruckmanites? Let me see your hands. Go oh, Ruckmanites? There you go. That kind of stuff. That's, that's uh, somebody, somebody that God isn't using. Always gives you that rough, all that line, you know. Or they're not getting you like they like to have God use them. Ruckman, Ruckman, Ruckman. I get so tired of hearing that. How, how many of you people believe the Word of God was, the King James Bible is the Word of God before you ever heard of me? Let me see your hands. Amen. Well, it's 90% of your congregation. But who poisoned you? <laughs> you know what they do? They blame the Holy Spirit for me and blame me for the Holy Spirit. I don't know how these fellows get me confused with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, that's how close to blasphemy can you get, man? You'd think with the opinion they had of me, they couldn't get me confused with the Holy Ghost, would you? You don't teach you that Bible is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit teaches you that Bible is the Word of God. You ain't Ruckman. Ruckman, Ruckman, or I'll Ruckman your foot. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, here's Christ dying on the cross. Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and the third day he rose again from the dead according to the Scriptures. Wherefore he is able to save the uttermost all them that come unto God by him seeing he had liveth to make intercession for them. By your stripes you're healed. Thou shalt commit adultery, paid for. Thou shalt not steal, paid for. Honor your father and your mother, paid for. Thou shalt not kill, paid for. A high look and a proud heart and the plying of the wicked is sin. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You say, What's that got to do with you drawing up there? Well, when we draw Christ crucified, and I stopped right down here at his waist, when we draw Christ crucified, we're always careful to put a loincloth on him for sake of decency. And that's proper, and that's true. And we put a loincloth on him, but let's just face it, folks, he was naked. He was naked. That's the shame of crucifixion. Take your Bible and heard of John chapter 19. He said, what's that got to do with this thing you're talking about here? Well, I didn't tell you what I'd done there. I just drew, I just drew you a picture of Christ with his clothes on, and his body is under his clothes. And someday you're going to see a male stripper John 19, John 19, there's Christ on the cross, John 19, verse 23 and 24. Notice what his clothes are called, sometimes a coat, sometimes raiment, sometimes they cast lots for my vesture, and sometimes garment. His clothes are never called robe, never. Beverly Shea had a song he sang many years ago called The Robe, The Robe, His Robe, His Robe, May Its Glory Endure Forever and All That Gas. And that fellow Lloyd Douglas wrote a book called The Robe. Christ didn't have any robe. Amen. You know, Demetrius the Gladiator, you know, in the magic robe floating around the country and all that Catholic baloney. Uh, Christ had garment, vesture, and a coat, but never, never a robe. The robe was a Roman robe. They put the robe on him and they took it off him and when well, they sent him on the cross. And when they got talking about what to do with his clothes, they said, this coat, we can't do nothing with it because it's woven from the top. 
And the coat is made like this. There's the hole in the top. And the coat, the weave, goes like this, so it becomes one piece of clothing like that. And if you want to divide it up in five pieces, you destroy it. So they're going to shoot dice for it. Now that piece of clothing is what you call a poncho. And that piece of clothing is what a fisherman wears, a Galilean fisherman. And when that fellow puts that poncho on, it looks like this. Like that. Now you may have a variety now, you buy now, where the fellow has some sleeves here with his hand coming out of it. But the man's body goes there like that, and the poncho is like that. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 1. This is going to be the great day. This is the day God takes off his clothes. And he says, you want to look at something? I'll show you something. And boy, brother, sister, when the world's on fire, you better hope God's bosom will be your pillow. You see, people keep, they keep thinking that Bible is just a little book that tells you how to live a good life. Amen. That book controls the universe. Oh, yeah. And that book tells what's going to happen to the universe and what's going to happen to you when it goes away. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, look at that verse 10 to 11. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. The earth and the heavens are going to wax old like a garment. And like a vesture, you're going to fold them up and they'll be changed. Keep on reading. But his years endure forever. They don't ever change. Lord, so lift up your eye and look at the heavens. They wax old like a garment. But my righteous shall not be abolished. You know what that is? That's God's clothing. The universe. That's why men want it. They want to steal his clothes. It's ours. EPA. The environment. It belongs to us. You see? Turn to Psalms. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. Psalm 8, verse 3. Here's his clothes. He's inside them. The universe is not God. That's pantheism. All these modern electronic force field boys like Hawking and Einstein and the rest of the blockheads, they don't have the sense God gave a brass monkey. And if they blew the brains out, they'd have nothing to lose. <laughs> That bunch, they all say that the universe is the is eternal. The electronic force field is God. That's what they teach in the schools. I know what they teach in the schools. That's what they teach in the schools. But that's just his clothing. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his what? What? Again. Made some, some clothes. Handiwork. Psalm 8, Psalm 8, Psalm 8, verse 3. Somebody back here at the back, read it out real loud. Psalm 8, verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, oh. the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. Isn't that something, the work of thy fingers? You see that stuff? You like the Lord said, all right? <laughs> and out come the stars. <laughs> out come the galaxies. <laughs> out come the nebula. He made him some clothes. If you get north of here a little bit further, on some nights, probably in the winter, you'll see some northern lights. They're north. And what they look like is a bunch of curtains hanging down. Like a tent. Or a tabernacle. Where the Lord said, since the days I came out of Egypt, I have dwelt in a tent and in a tabernacle. Amen. You couldn't catch up with that King James Bible in X-15. Now, you know what the thing for this thing is? It's a mullet net. Now, I'm a mullet fisherman. I throw a cast net. You have braille nets and bag nets. And a braille net looks like that. And the lead line goes right down to the top of that thing and then to the bottom and then branches out to the bottom. And the lids are around here in the bottom like this. And when you throw that mullet net down like that. You see? And you take this lead line and pull it up. 
it pulls these in like this and takes the whole thing and holds it up like that. And then your net's out of the water and it's gone. But everything you wanted to catch is in the net. Now one day, you know what God says I'm going to do? I'm going to take off my clothes. When I do, you want to see me. I saw a great white throne, him that sat upon it, from before whose face the heaven and the earth fled away. And there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before. Look at that thing. You know what that means? That means if you're sitting here at night and you're on the sea, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be standing in outer space like this, and the whole cotton thing is going to blow, and you're going to right, be right before a holy, pure, naked creator you can't even look at. Dwelling in the light that no man can see or can approach unto. You know what they did do in there? The creator? They took his clothes off him. <laughs> That's what they did. If you're the son of God, come down the cross. Say, you know what they're doing? They're making fun of their creator. All things were made by him, and by him was nothing made that was made. Over here. He made the clothes. They took his clothes and shot dice for them. Made fun of their creator naked. You know what God's going to do? He's going to strip down and say, you want to see something? Watch this. Oh, that thing I like, and brother, brother, let me tell you, if you ain't saved, you ain't going to stand the chance of a snowball in hell. And that goes for the city commission in this town, and your mayor, and all your policemen, and all your firemen, all your doctors, and all your lawyers, you haven't got a big shot in Detroit, Michigan, that could take that. You haven't got a senator or a congressman that could take that thing right there, and that thing happens. When God takes that thing, he's going to take those clothes and take those clothes and take them up and hang them on a post like that. <laughs> and then you know what you're going to see there? You're going to see the naked glory of somebody who's pure spirit, pure energy. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And brother, if you're not in Christ, for the supernatural body, part of him, when that thing takes place, you're going to stand there and just look off like that. Yep. And you're not going to be able to even face it. You can't face it. You know something? I sure am glad I didn't live back in the days of the crucifixion. And was there with a crowd that made fun of him. In my mind's eye, I like to think that was, if I was back there, you know, I'd, I'd stand by him, you know. I mean, shoot, I've got kids older than he was. I got, I got a girl that was up around 50. He was only 33 when he died on the cross. That's a young man. That's a young man. And I often think, well, if I thought back there, I'd, I'd like to think I'd come up, put my arm around him and said, uh, I'm with you, buddy. More power to you, buddy. I'll stick with you. I'll stay with you. But I probably wouldn't have. I might have been back there in the mob. You know. Ah, uh, wag the head, not that. Uh, he saved others. If you're the... Boy, oh boy, when that bunch hits that thing there, you talk about a time, that's going to be a time. The thing goes away, and the bunch that saw him naked, see him naked again, but that time not as a man. That time you'll run to him as God. You ready for the run-in? Down... South, the colored folks sing a song that says, Oh, my loving brother, when the world's on fire, don't you want God bosom to be your pillow? Going to hide me over in the rock of ages. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless your people tonight. And I know I've been kind of heavy tonight, maybe kind of obtuse, and I hope not. But I know that you'll show them the truth. They stay in the book. We know the book has the answers. It's got all the answers. We know, Heavenly Father, this uh, book is a kiss of God and the lost soul of man. And if it weren't for this book, we wouldn't have any revelation about these things at all. Well, thank you, Father, that you preserve, preserve that book in this country as long as you have. And we know, Heavenly Father, the only hope this country ever had was this book. And we know the degree to which this book has been ignored and, and slighted and corrected and attacked. Our country has uh, deteriorated with it in direct proportion. And I pray for anybody here tonight that's unprepared to meet you in judgment, in your pure, naked, holy glory, they'll get ready tonight. 
and take the offering that you sent down here for them to die in their place. Now let's remain head bowed and eyes closed for just a few minutes and like to have our pianist play something for us while we remain in prayer a few minutes. And let me be very specific what I'm getting ready to say. I know most of you folks here tonight are saved. Probably all of you. Probably all of you. But don't you take a chance. You can't stand what you're going to face. You cannot do it. All the great, wise, noble, intelligent, brave men in the world will never be able to take it. You can't take it. You can't take it. You can't take the one that made the nebula and the star clusters facing off with you on your sins. You can't do it. And he knows you can't do it. So he loved you and came down here as a man. You can understand that. You can dig that. See? Because you're a man and took your place. Now, have you trusted him for your salvation? In that day, are you going to be safe in him or stand there, you know, blind, gaping, trembling, shaking, facing hell on wheels? How many of you people are saved and know it? Let me see your hand. You're saved and you know it. All right, you couldn't raise a hand here. There's one or two things wrong. Either not saved or else you've gotten saved and it's a backslidden. You can't give a testimony anymore. You don't know you're saved. Something else. And what you'll do right now as we close this service is right there where you're sitting. Just bow your head and close your eyes and call upon his name for salvation and trust what he did for you. You say, I can't believe it. Then you're in one cotton-picking mess. And you're not about to get out of it either. If that book is true, you see what I've showed you here tonight, that's just touching the hem of the garment, the hem of the garment. <laughs> if that book is true, you're facing a disaster. Now mind the churches, the preachers, the sacraments, all that stuff, you're facing a catastrophe. If that book is true. Father, bless your word tonight. May the Holy Spirit do his job tonight. Convince of sin, rights, and judgment. I've said all I can say. I've done all I can do. You'll have to do the rest. Lord, may you confirm your word. You said heaven and earth shall pass away. But your word wouldn't. And help somebody to see that tonight and put their faith in that eternal, immutable, infallible word. And believe what you promised. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to let your pastor close the service tonight as the Lord leads it.